week, we stopped by Clover Club to see Speed Rack founder and pioneering bartender Ivy Mix. She shared a delicious spring cocktail with us and a few words on creating your own path. I am Ivy Mix and I am a bartender. Um, we're here at Clover Club in Brooklyn, New York, which is where I bartend. This is kind of an empire for women um, in the cocktail and culinary community. My boss, Julie Reiner, owns this bar and really pioneered the way for women in the cocktail industry. And I like to think that I'm trying to follow in her footsteps, so I'm really happy to be here today. We're making a drink today that's going to be made with tequila, because it's springtime and summertime, and it's spring and summer, I think that tequila is what we should be drinking. So we're just gonna have a little bit of tequila ocho, some lemon juice, a little bit of grapefruit juice, get a little bit more citrus in there, and chamomile syrup. It's really easy to make. You take a chamomile tea. As it's brewing, you add one part sugar to one part strong brewed tea. I'm also gonna put some raspberries in there, give it a little bit of um, brightness. It's important to use a good tequila. Tequila, by law, only has to be 51% blue agave, which is why if you had a bad experience of it in college, you may have had 49% of God knows what, and 51% of blue agave. So it's really important to go buy blue agave, 100% blue agave, and tequila ocho, I think, is just one of the best expressions of what is possible to do with tequila. So you want to give it a real good shake. The reason why you want to give it a good shake is that you want to kind of pulverize those raspberries in there. And you can shake in anything. You don't need a big fancy shaker like this. We're straining it over a special kind of crushed ice right now, but you can really, you can either crush ice yourself or you can just put this over regular ice and it'll be just as fine. But it looks very pretty this way. And it's a nice way to ooh and all your friends. So even when drinks don't have mint in it, I like to put a little mint on top because it really makes it fresh tasting. I just spanked it there, word of the wise, if you use a piece of mint and you just smell it, it doesn't smell like much, but if you hit it, it releases the oils, so you can smell it. I can smell it right now. Yeah, right? Awesome. So it just released it. Put some raspberries on top. There we go. So you're so passionate about cocktails. How did that passion start? What inspired you to get involved in this industry? So my whole background is in art. I went to college for fine art and philosophy, which at the time was very eccentric and very um, unique. Come to graduation, I found it was very hard to get a job. All the way throughout college, I actually bartended. I went to a very liberal school. We had a winter term called field work term. And the field work term was where you had to go do work in your field, not on campus. You went elsewhere. I decided to go to Guatemala uh, my first year, 19 years old, and I ended up falling in love with this bar there called Cafe No Se in Antigua, Guatemala. I started bartending. Um, it was a bar that specialized in tequila and mezcal, which then gave me an opportunity to travel throughout Mexico while I was in college, learning more about it. First as a cultural interest, and then much more so as just learning a lot about the spirit. But when I graduated, I didn't really, I thought I was going to be an artist. Like I really was like, this is what I'm gonna do. When I graduated college, it was the beginning of the economic collapse. Everyone I knew was working for free in internships. That's kind of what you did when you, you know, when we, well, when we graduated, you, you worked in internships, that's what we did. Yeah. And I had a really quote unquote great job. When I graduated, people were like, you're really killing it. Like, what a great internship. And I was like, I can't pay my bills. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I went back to what I knew, which was working in the service industry. I got a cocktail waitressing job at a tequila bar in the East Village called Maya Well, um, because I had a, a plethora of knowledge on tequila and mezcal from my time in Guatemala. And that's where I discovered what cocktails could really be like. It took me maybe a month to realize, like, hey, I could be creative, I could be an artist, and I could bartend, which I love doing, I love the social aspect of it, mm -hmm. um, all at once. So I was like, okay, done, like, let's like, move forward. And I can make money. Like, what a, what, a, what a weird concept to make money and make your art <laughs> at the same time. So I kind of transferred from visual art to, like, palette art. We use the buzzword mixology, right? Mm -hmm. And if you Google mixologist, you'll end up getting a whole series of memes, basically, of the dude in the suspenders with the mustache. And, you know, <laughs> especially when I started getting into cocktail bartending, that was really the norm. And there wasn't much room for a lady in that meme scenario. Fast forward a few years, Julie Reiner, who's my boss, who I had mentioned before, who's a big inspiration of mine, she was opening a bar in Soho, and I asked her for a job. And I was like, if you're a lady, I'm a lady. She's done lots of good things for other women in the industry, and I was like, I want a job. I mean, this is my background, and she did. And then 
fast forward another few years, she brings me here to Clover Club. I've been here for quite some time, and that's where I am now. <laughs> I'm a curious about like what you're saying with sort of the male mixologist and your relationship in such like a man's world, your experience as a bartender with men behind the bar and with men in front of the bar. Yeah, there is a certain you know, sex object thing of a, of a woman, you know? And I think that part of the issues with women in the past coming behind bars and working in them, especially in this, in this level of commitment that this industry now requires, is that people, there was a stigma that perhaps women were relying upon that sex object-ness mm -hmm. to get a career rather than taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the thing to break through. It was like, no, no, I really, 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 really do want to do this. You know, I'm not yeah. just trying to be a sex object behind a bar. I really, like, take this seriously and this is what I want to do. But at the same token, um, I think that women should embrace their femininity and I don't think that they should throw it away just because they're behind the bar. You know, just as much as, like, I'm not relying on this I'm a woman behind a bar, like, don't give me a job because you want me to be a sex object behind your bar. I also still want to be a lady behind the bar, and I want to be feminine, I want to be welcoming. You know, women are moms, you know, and they we're hospitable, and we're welcoming, and we're warming, and we can really draw upon that, I think, and create a really excellent experience for our customers, which in the end of the day is the end goal. Right. You know, we're in the hospitality industry. But can you tell us a little bit more about Speed Rack and, sure. and what that is? And how yeah. you came upon it? It's an all-female bartending competition that goes across the country and while being a platform for women in our industry to stand on and be like, as I said, like, hey, I'm here, hire me, put me in your bars, hire me to work for your brands, you know, I'm not just hiding behind that guy over there on a Saturday night, like, I'm really working, hire me. Um, on top of that, we also raise money for breast cancer research and prevention. So it's a dual purpose. And 100% of the proceeds, that, so every penny you spend, every t-shirt you buy, every ticket you buy, goes to the breast cancer related charities that we support. Tell me about your process of when you are crafting that cocktail and like that aha Sorry. moment. So different people have different ways of making cocktails. I am much more, and even like when I was in college and I did my philosophy, I was an analytic philosopher, right? Well, I was a philosopher, but I, was, <laughs> I did analytic <laughs> philosophy, which is like, point A, point B, and like blah, 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 blah. So what I usually do is I taste, I taste a spirit and I take tasting notes because everything has tasting notes. We just have to educate our minds to put words to what we're tasting, um, just like any art criticism or what have mm -hmm. you. And then based on those notes and those flavor profiles, I'll plug in different things that will enhance what I taste in that thing. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I like a lot about Mezcal is that you could take tasting notes for days. Like if you just take one sip or you taste that cocktail, like you could write a lot about just that cocktail. Okay, so I taste raspberries and I taste smoke. What kind of smoke? Hickory smoke? Beef jerky? Um, campfire? You know, um, maybe burnt pineapple, burnt fruit? Um, and you can then think, okay, so what else shares those attributes that could enhance those things? So I, it's essentially like a skeleton. Like I think of a skeleton that I'm putting muscle on. Like, okay, here's my skeleton. I know that I want, I know I want this you know, the skeleton to have like a thigh, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll put the thigh on, like, all right, now I know I want to have an arm at least, and I'll put the arm on. And sometimes it's really simple, like two ingredients. Sometimes it's complicated, like seven yeah. <laughs> or eight. Um, so yeah, that's fine.